This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This month I'm covering cases of crimes that happened on school campuses. In this episode, I'll cover a case that sparked a national debate and shown a spotlight on discrepancies in the justice system regarding the treatment and rights of survivors of sexual assault. Brock Turner was a first year student at Stanford University when he was accused of sexually assaulting a young woman. His status as a student at a top rated university and his designation as a star athlete resulted in uneven portrayals in the media between the victim and the perpetrator. It also launched public discussions on the need for victims' voices to be heard above the din of the media frenzy surrounding such well-publicized crimes. While much has been reported about this case and its impact on the rights of sexual assault victims, most have not heard the whole story of what occurred on Stanford University's campus in January 2015. You may be surprised to find that the details are quite different from what most people assume to be true. That is the story you will hear in this episode. This is Chapter 3 of Crimes on Campus, Brock Turner. On the morning of January 28, 2015, Chanel Miller woke up to the sound of an incoming text. It was from her younger sister, Tiffany. She had sent a screenshot of a news item that was printed in the local newspaper. It appeared to be from a crime log, a summary of calls responded to by the police department and published weekly in the newspaper and online. Each item contained short descriptions of each crime or incident reported. The brief paragraph Chanel received was dated Sunday, January 18th, 10 days earlier. It read, an individual was arrested and transported to the San Jose main jail for attempted rape at 1 a.m. near Lomita Court. As Chanel read the item, a stab of anxiety and dread went through her. She was relieved that no one was identified by name in the column. Maybe she didn't have to worry, she thought. She tried to convince herself that this was, most likely, the only mention of the incident that would be reported. But later that morning, she couldn't help searching for that day's news. Just moments later, she came across an online article. Stanford athlete accused of raping unconscious woman, the headline read. She clicked on the story, and the first thing that popped up was a photo of the accused, a young man with blonde hair who appeared to be in his late teens. In the photo, he is dressed in a suit, wearing a red tie, and smiling at the camera. Chanel studied the photo for a moment or two. She had never seen this young man before. He was a stranger to her. And yet she knew that the unconscious woman the article referred to was herself. This was the first time she had learned his name, Brock Turner. She read the accompanying article. It stated that Turner had been charged with five felony counts, rape of an intoxicated person, rape of an unconscious person, sexual penetration by a foreign object of an intoxicated person, sexual penetration by a foreign object of an unconscious person, an assault with intent to commit rape. The article also stated that Turner had posted $150,000 bail and was released from jail the day he was taken into custody. Chanel now wondered if there were more details made public. So far, her name had not been mentioned, which was a relief. But she was also surprised to find that even the information she'd easily found online contained more details than she had been privy to up to this point. The truth was, Chanel's only memory of the night of January 17th and the early morning hours of January 18th was that she had attended a party on the Stanford University campus with her sister. There was a lot of alcohol being served, and she had drank quite a bit and become intoxicated. The last thing she remembered was trying to find a bathroom. Hours later, Chanel had woken up in a hospital room to find two men standing over her, a Stanford University dean and a police officer. She was asked a few questions, but not provided with many details by the officer. He finally explained to Chanel that they suspected she may have been sexually assaulted after leaving the party. Chanel was shocked, to say the least. 
She hadn't even talked to any guys at the party, she explained. How could this have happened? At first, she assumed it must be some sort of mistake. But once she was permitted to use the restroom, she discovered that the dress she had worn to the party the night before was now bunched up around her waist. Her underwear was missing, and she had no explanation for this. She had been given a pair of green hospital pants to wear, and her hair was disheveled and pine needles were stuck in the tangles. The officer explained that she had been found passed out near the fraternity house where the party had taken place. She was also told that a male was found near her who, according to the detective, was, quote, acting hinky. She learned that two other men had observed this person kneeling over her prone body. These two men had intervened and summoned help. That was all Chanel knew until 10 days later, she conducted an internet search and learned more of the story. Years afterward, she would recount what it was like to learn what had happened to her by reading it online. In an interview with Lester Holt on CBS's 60 Minutes news program in 2021, Chanel said, quote, Having the news broken to me by the internet, I was alone, sitting at my desk, surrounded by coworkers, reading about how I was stripped and then penetrated and discarded in a bed of pine needles behind a dumpster. And I finally understood the name, Brock Turner, end quote. Chanel continued searching online for details. She discovered a police report in which officers described her condition when they arrived. She was unresponsive and lying on the ground behind a dumpster with, quote, her dress bunched up near her waist, her buttocks and vagina visible, her right breast exposed, and her underwear lying next to her on the ground, end quote. Ten days. Ten days had passed since she'd woken up in the hospital and was told she had possibly been a victim of sexual assault. She'd agreed to a full medical examination at that time and had a rape kit done on her. Her body was swabbed for blood and semen, and the samples were sent to a lab for analysis. She'd also noticed that her hands had blood on them, but she didn't know why. She was interviewed by a detective who asked her questions about what she could recall. Some of his questions she could answer, and others she could not. How did she come to be at the party? Who else was there? How much had she had to eat and drink the night before? How much alcohol had she consumed and what kind? Had she met someone at the party? Hooked up with someone? To this last question, Chanel emphatically responded no. She had not even spoken to any guys at the party. The detective informed her that they had a person of interest in custody, the man who'd been acting hinky around her. He explained that they were trying to determine whether they had the right man and were still trying to determine exactly what had happened. Before he left, he gave her his card and asked her to call him if she remembered anything else. Chanel was finally allowed to leave the hospital and return home. In the 10 days since, Chanel had received no phone calls, no visits, and no new information from either the police or the hospital. She assumed that the matter had been closed. Now that the media had gotten a hold of the story, soon it became headline news, mainly due to the reputation of the accused. Chanel didn't know it yet, but her ordeal was just beginning. Hey there, this is Esther from Once Upon a Crime. A big thank you to all our new YouTube subscribers. If you like what you're seeing, make sure to tell a friend and share the true crime stories. Another way to support our show and keep getting Once Upon a Crime on YouTube is to buy me a coffee. Click on the link in the description box below to donate a couple of bucks to the show. Any amount is appreciated. You will have my undying gratitude. Thanks. Chanel Elizabeth Miller was born on June 12, 1992 and grew up in Palo Alto, California. Stanford University was just a stone's throw away from her home. She and her younger sister Tiffany spent time on the campus of the prestigious school during their childhood and teen years. Their mother, Mei Mei, grew up during China's Cultural Revolution before emigrating to the U.S. She was a writer who published four books of fiction and essays and encouraged her daughters to pursue art as well as academics. Chanel and her family considered Stanford's campus as a resource for both of these pursuits, visiting the library and its art museum and attending cultural events that were open to the public. Chanel attended Palo Alto's Henry M. Gunn High School and then the University of California, Santa Barbara, graduating with a degree in literature. She aspired to be a children's author. 
She was a student at UC Santa Barbara in 2014, when 22-year-old Elliot Roger went on a killing spree not far from the campus. He would kill six and wound 14 others before killing himself. Elliot Rogers' actions would later be cited by other mass killers as, quote, their inspiration. After graduating from college, Chanel returned home to Palo Alto to take a position at a small tech startup company. On January 17, 2015, as a recent college graduate, 22-year-old Chanel was living back home with her parents when her sister Tiffany invited her to a fraternity party on the Stanford University campus. Tiffany, a student at Cal Poly, or California Polytechnic State University, was home for the weekend, and her friend Julia, a Stanford student, told her about the party at the Kappa Alpha house. Tiffany invited Chanel to come along. Chanel balked at the idea. Why would she attend a frat party with a bunch of young college students, she said. She would be at least three or four years older than everyone else in attendance, and she knew that the majority of partygoers would probably be first-year students out to party and hook up. She told Tiffany she'd fill out a place and declined the invitation. But her sister convinced her, saying it would allow them to spend more time together while she was home. The sisters were close, and Chanel did miss hanging out with her younger sister, so she reluctantly agreed. While they got ready for the party, the girls had some drinks. Chanel drank a couple of glasses of champagne. They asked their mother to drive them to the Kappa Alpha house, located about seven minutes away. She dropped the girls off at the party around 11 p.m. The festivities were in full swing when they arrived. Chanel and Tiffany and Tiffany's friend Julia drank and danced and had a good time together. Chanel had some vodka drinks and was offered shots of whiskey, which she accepted. She remembered being intoxicated enough to get up on a chair and dance. The girls were laughing and having fun. At just before midnight, Chanel tried to use the frat house's bathroom, but it was occupied. She would later admit that by this point, she was pretty drunk and not thinking very clearly. She decided to go outside to find a bush to pee behind, unable to wait for the bathroom to be available. It was the last thing she remembered clearly about that night. At around the same time, Chanel went outside alone. Her sister Tiffany left the party for a few minutes to walk her friend back to her dorm room. It was at this point that she lost track of Chanel. Chanel's boyfriend Lucas, whom she'd been dating for several months, was in Philadelphia, and there was a three-hour time difference between them. Chanel placed a call to Lucas at 11.54 p.m., or almost 3 a.m. his time. The call lasted three minutes. She would not remember making the call. Her boyfriend would later tell her that she didn't say very much on the call, and what she did say mostly sounded like gibberish. The call cut off abruptly. A few minutes later, Chanel called again. This time it went to voicemail. In the recorded message, Chanel sounds inebriated. She would later make Lucas promise not to erase the message. Tiffany returned to the frat house, but the party had been shut down due to excessive noise. Everyone was leaving, but she didn't see Chanel anywhere. She began asking if anyone had seen a girl who looked like her. The two sisters were often mistaken for one another because they looked so similar. No one had seen her, and Tiffany began to grow worried. Just before 1 a.m., two Stanford graduate students from Sweden, Carl Frederick Arndt and Peter Johnson, were riding their bikes through the campus on the way to a late-night party when they saw two figures near a dumpster. A petite female was lying on the ground and was not moving. The male who was kneeling above her was, quote, moving a lot, Arndt later recalled. They thought it looked strange, so they approached the male. As they did so, he turned towards them and stood up. They could see that the female wasn't moving at all. What the hell are you doing, they asked. At that moment, the blonde man ran. Arndt ran after him. I didn't really have time to think, so I chased after him, Arndt later said in a television interview. I remember it quite vividly. I was on his left side, and I got my right leg in front of him. I took my upper body and threw him over my leg and down on the ground, end quote. Meanwhile, Johnson stayed with Chanel, who was still unconscious. He tried to shake her and ask her if she was okay, but she didn't move or respond. Alarmed, he called for help. A deputy was dispatched to the scene and placed the blonde man in his police cruiser. 
an ambulance was summoned, and Chanel Miller, still unresponsive, was transported to Santa Clara Valley Medical Center in San Jose. The male who had been prevented from fleeing by the two Good Samaritans was handcuffed and read his Miranda rights. He waved them and identified himself as Brock Allen Turner, a first-year Stanford student. Nineteen-year-old Brock Turner graduated from Oakwood High School in Ohio the previous spring. He was the youngest of three children born to Dan and Carlene Turner, an electrical engineer and a registered nurse. Turner was a competitive swimmer who'd won several state titles and held a record for the 500-meter swim. He had been awarded the title of All-American Swimmer three times. He was accepted to Stanford University, awarded an athletic scholarship, and given a place on the swim team. He began attending Stanford the summer before his arrest. When the news of his arrest and the later trial was reported in the media, the headlines all mentioned Turner's accomplishments alongside the crime he was suspected of committing. Stanford swimmer denies alleged rape in the police report. Woman and Stanford swim star accused of sexually assaulting her both testify. All-American swimmer charged with assaulting an unconscious woman on Stanford campus. Three-time All-American Stanford swimmer, well, you get the idea. Brock Turner was charged with two counts of rape, two counts of penetration, and one count of assault with intent to rape. He was released the same day after his parents posted $150,000 bail. When interviewed by police, Turner claimed that he had met the victim at the party, they drank beer together, danced, and kissed. He would invited her to his dorm room and she'd accepted, Turner said. They left the party together, quote, holding hands, and while walking on the street, she slipped and fell. They had both laughed and then begun kissing. They continued making out on the ground, according to Turner, and he had been lying over her. He claimed that she was conscious and alert. When the two men approached him and asked what he was doing, he claimed they'd acted aggressively towards him, so he ran. Turner admitted that he'd also had a lot to drink that night. He'd had five beers and two shots of fireball whiskey in a friend's room before leaving for the party. After arriving, he had more drinks, estimating that he'd consumed a total of nine alcoholic drinks in total. His blood alcohol content was tested and estimated to be approximately 0.17% at the time of his arrest. Chanel also had her BAC tested in the hospital. By that time, it had shown as 0.12%, but was estimated to be about 0.22% at 1 a.m. when she was admitted. An IV had been inserted after her arrival and would have diluted her blood. A reading of 0.08% is considered legally intoxicated in the state of California. Chanel tested at three times that amount, and she did not regain consciousness until three hours after she arrived at the emergency room. She had not responded to shaking or shouting by paramedics, and they testified that she only opened her eyes after her nail beds were pinched. The voicemail message Chanel left for her boyfriend would be entered into evidence by the prosecution at Turner's trial. It was described as almost entirely incomprehensible, and the prosecutor cited this as proof that she was in no state to give consent. In contrast, Turner appeared to be lucid and alert and gave a full statement of his activities that night. Female DNA and blood were also found under his fingernails on both hands. Chanel woke up in the hospital with dried blood on her hands and elbows, which the prosecution suggested had been caused by Turner dragging her behind the dumpster. Turner pled not guilty and was represented by a Bay Area attorney with 30 years of experience, Michael Armstrong. Faced with disciplinary action by the university for underage drinking as well as his arrest, Turner withdrew from Stanford University. Two days later, he was told by school officials that he was banned from campus. Chanel's sister Tiffany was interviewed by investigators soon after Chanel was released from the hospital. She also described the atmosphere at the party, lots of drinking, etc. She was asked if there was anything in particular she remembered from that night. Tiffany described an encounter with a curly-haired blonde guy who was following her around the party. He didn't talk to her, but kept putting his face close to hers, and he placed his hands on her hips. They weren't dancing, and she found him odd. She didn't know his name and had never met him before. He had attempted to lean in and kiss her several times, but Tiffany ducked away from him. 
Out of nervousness, she had laughed once and said he was so close to her face that their teeth touched. Finally, she told him she had to leave and was able to get away from him. Soon afterward, she left the party to walk her friend home. She was shown a photo lineup and asked if she could identify any of the men in the pictures as the person who tried to kiss her at the party. She immediately picked out the person depicted in photo number four. Tiffany said she was sure it was him. It was a picture of Brock Turner. It was at that moment that Tiffany realized the guy who'd been coming on to her at the party was the one who'd gone after Chanel. Had he mistaken her older sister for her? Did he follow Chanel outside because she resembled the woman who blew off his advances? Was he attempting to get revenge for being rebuffed? She would never know, but she felt awful, like somehow she'd contributed to her sister's attack. Of course, she was in no way to blame, but we often feel like we should be able to protect the ones we love. As a sexual assault victim, Chanel was allowed to remain anonymous. She chose the name Emily Doe to be used in the record to keep her identity private. The trial began in March of 2016 and lasted two weeks. Turner's defense attorney would claim that the victim consented to the sexual encounter, but was too drunk to remember. He also attempted to discredit every witness, including her sister Tiffany, as too intoxicated to be reliable. Chanel testified in court and broke down in tears upon explaining how she'd felt upon waking in the hospital with pine needles in her hair, dried blood on her hands and elbows, and her clothes in disarray or missing. The last thing she remembered clearly, she told the court, was drinking and dancing next to her younger sister and her friend at the Alpha Kappa party. Turner also testified and continued to claim that Chanel had given consent before passing out. He said she was still awake and alert when they began making out, and he'd only gotten up and walked away from her after telling her that he, quote, felt nauseous and needed to vomit from consuming too much alcohol. It was as he walked away to find a place to throw up that he was accosted by the graduate students and tackled to the ground, Turner said. He blamed alcohol and college life for his bad decisions, including underage drinking and drinking to excess. During Turner's time on the stand, his attorney took him through his history of academic and athletic accomplishments. He painted his client as a naive first-year college student who was an inexperienced drinker. Turner claimed that he'd felt pressured to fit in with his new friends and swim team buddies and simply overindulged but had not attempted to rape anyone. The district attorney, however, had discovered more information about Turner's behavior before and leading up to his arrest. Text messages pulled from his cell phone records exposed him as a young man who'd had plenty of experience, not only with alcohol, but drugs as well. In July 2014, while still in high school, Turner texted a friend about doing acid and expressed an interest in, quote, candy flipping, a slang term for taking LSD and ecstasy together. Other text messages recorded Turner attempting to score highly concentrated forms of marijuana. Do you think I could buy some wax so we can do some dabs? He texted a friend. The prosecution also provided information at trial regarding his prior arrest record. In 2014, Turner was arrested for possession of alcohol while under the legal drinking age. He and some of his teammates were chased by police after being found drinking beer on campus. Another witness came forward and reported that Turner had attended another Kappa Alpha party just a week before the assault. This young woman testified that Turner, quote, creeped her out and was grabby with her. He came up to her as she was dancing and began placing his hands on her waist, stomach, and thigh. She hadn't invited him to dance with her and had not sought out his attention, she reported. He made her so uncomfortable she'd left the dance floor to get away from him. Before the trial began, the two charges of rape were dropped against Turner, but he still faced three felony charges, including assault with intent to commit rape and sexual penetration of an intoxicated person and an unconscious person. After a two-week trial, the jury found him guilty of three counts of sexual assault. The prosecutor asked for a six-year sentence. Turner's attorney urged the judge to sentence his client to a maximum of four months in jail, saying, quote, The fact remains that no one can pinpoint exactly when the victim went from being conscious to unconscious, end quote. He also said that Turner was a fundamentally good young man from a good family, with a record of real accomplishments, who made bad choices during his four months at Stanford, especially related to alcohol, and the 20 minutes or so during the night of January 17th and 18th, when he committed these serious crimes, end quote. While Turner waited for his sentence to be handed down, 
several friends and family members sent letters to the judge or made statements to the press. Almost all of them blamed alcohol for Turner's actions, saying that he was too intoxicated to make a conscious determination whether the young woman he was with gave consent or not. Turner's father reacted to the prosecution's request for a six-year prison term in a letter to the court, stating that the sentence was, quote, a steep price to pay for 20 minutes of action out of his 20-plus years of life, end quote. The phrase, 20 minutes of action, sparked outrage from sexual assault survivors and those who advocated for victims' rights, as well as the public in general. But other members of the public blamed the victim for her attack. Why was a 22-year-old at a frat party, they asked. Why did she drink so much? Some even faulted Chanel for wearing a dress. Why was she wearing a dress in January, one online commenter wrote. On June 2, 2016, Chanel Miller read an impact statement in court. The 7,000-word-plus statement read by Emily Doe was described as a, quote, cri de corps against the role of privilege in the trial and the way the legal system deals with sexual assault, unquote. This was printed in the New York Times. She read her statement out loud, quote, You took away my worth, my privacy, my energy, my time, my safety, my intimacy, my confidence, my own voice, until today, she read to the defendant in court. To the judge, she said, The fact that Brock was a star athlete at a prestigious university should not be seen as an entitlement to leniency, but as an opportunity to send a strong cultural message that sexual assault is against the law, regardless of social class, end quote. Her statement was later released by Santa Clara County and picked up and shared in national and international publications, including the Washington Post, Time Magazine, and the UK's The Guardian. It went viral, shared over 11 million times in four days. Then Vice President Joe Biden wrote an open letter to Emily Doe stating, quote, I am filled with furious anger both that this happened to you and that our culture is still so broken that you were ever put in the position of defending your own worth, end quote. Even so, on the same day Chanel's powerful statement was made in court, Judge Aaron Persky sentenced Brock Turner to just six months in jail. He defended his decision by stating that a harsher sentence would have, quote, a severe impact on Turner's life. After serving just three months in jail, Turner was released on September 2, 2016, after earning time off his sentence for good behavior. He was required to serve three years of probation and register as a sex offender for the rest of his life. Turner's lenient sentence and early release were met with backlash by the public. Two weeks after Persky handed down the sentence, California Assembly Bill AB 2888, written by District Attorney Jeff Rosen, was introduced and would later be unanimously approved by the California legislature. The bill would provide for a mandatory minimum three-year prison sentence for sexual assault of an unconscious or intoxicated person. An online position demanding that Judge Persky be removed from the bench amassed over a million signatures within a week of Turner's sentencing a committee to recall Judge Persky was formed. A fierce debate began between those who supported the judge and those who wanted him ousted. By January of 2018, enough signatures had been verified to place a recall vote of the judge on the midterm election ballot. It was voted on in June of 2018. Nearly 200,000 Santa Clara County voters cast ballots. 65% voted to recall the judge, with just 38% voting no. Aaron Persky was the first judge to be recalled by voters in California in over 80 years. In an interview he gave to the press, Persky stated that he had no regrets about the sentence he handed down for Brock Turner and said he would rule the same if asked again. In 2019, Aaron Persky accepted a position of tennis coach at a Silicon Valley high school. A short time later, an online petition circulated calling for his removal as JV tennis coach at Lindbrook High School in San Jose. The school district fired him the next day, with the superintendent of schools citing the need to, quote, protect the players from the potentially intrusive media attention, end quote. Due to the media attention of the case, Brock Turner's parents asked for protection upon his release. 
Protesters had gathered in his hometown in Ohio, where he was mandated by the court to reside with his parents. The Turners reported fearing for their safety when some of the protesters showed up armed with weapons. In December of 2017, Brock Turner petitioned for his conviction to be overturned and his lifetime requirement to register as a sex offender canceled. He requested a new trial, arguing, among other things, that the jury should have been given the option to consider less serious charges and that he should have been able to call character witnesses during the trial. It was also reported that Turner attempted to argue that he'd intended to engage, quote, in outer course, not intercourse, with his victim. He lost his appeal. A former Olympic swim team hopeful, Brock Turner was permanently banned from ever stepping foot on Stanford University's campus and also received a lifetime ban from competing in the Olympics. As of January of 2022, Turner reportedly was living with his parents in Ohio and working as a shipping and receiving clerk, earning $12 per hour. On August 19, 2019, Emily Doe was featured on an episode of CBS's 60 Minutes and went public, identifying herself by her real name, Chanel Miller. The following month, her memoir was released. Titled Know My Name, it won the 2019 National Book Critics Circle Award and made several other national book lists that year. A publisher recognized Chanel's writing talent after reading her inspirational impact statement and worked with her on a book deal. She abandoned her dream to become a children's author, doubting that parents would buy books for their children written by someone connected to such a well-publicized sexual assault case. Instead, she enrolled in the Rhode Island School of Design and reconnected with her interest in art. Her therapist recommended it as a way to process her emotions in the aftermath of her assault. She eventually began publishing pandemic-themed cartoons in Time and The New Yorker, and in August of 2020, some of her whimsical cartoon characters were placed prominently on display. A 75-foot mural created by Chanel, exploring the themes of personal trauma and healing, was placed on view at San Francisco's Asian Art Museum, located in Golden Gate Park. The vinyl mural titled, I Was, I Am, I Will Be, printed from one of her hand drawings, graced the glass wall of the newly renovated contemporary art gallery space and was visible to pedestrians on Hyde Street. You can find links to her book and find resources for survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, gender-based violence, and other social issues on her website, chanel-miller.com. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. If you'd like to get all episodes of Once Upon a Crime ad-free, you can join our Patreon. For as little as $2 a month, you can gain access to ad-free early release episodes and bonus content. This month, I'll be sharing a bonus episode with listeners regarding this case. I'll share more of Chanel Miller's impact statement, details from her memoir that didn't make it into this episode, and read and discuss Brock Turner's statement to the court. There's a lot to unpack there, and I hope you'll join me on Patreon to hear more. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to get more information and become a member. Thank you. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. My research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Until next time, be good to one another.